This is Steve Larson with the Horge Dairyman staff, welcoming all of you out there that are with us. We've got a nice uh, live audience growing uh, uh, at, the, at the present time. We uh, really look forward to the presentation today by Dr. Paul Volkler on troubleshooting mastitis, and uh, we want to special, give special thanks to Acumen Detection uh, for their sponsorship for the webinar today. And with those comments, I will uh, introduce Mike Hutchins, our co-host and partner in this venture down at the University of Illinois. Uh, Mike, go ahead and introduce our presenter and get us rolling. Very good, Steve. Well, welcome. Uh, we certainly want to welcome everybody online here, and it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Paul Verkler, who was born in uh, actually in a dairy farm in Lewis County, New York, and he attended uh, Cornell University, where he attained both his bachelor's of science and his doctor of veterinary medicine degrees, and then spent seven years as a veterinarian at the Attica Veterinary Clinic in Western New York, and many of our listeners will know exactly where that is. He then uh, went to work at De La Valve as a technical service veterinarian and then on to their animal health diagnostic center in their vet support services area. Currently, Dr. Verkler Ver Ver is working as an extension veterinarian for the quality milk uh, production uh, program or services in the state of New York. So, Dr. Verkler, we want to welcome you and the webinar is yours. Great. Good morning or good afternoon, everyone. And uh, we're ready to start rolling here. And we're going to today focus on uh, the topic of troubleshooting mastitis and looking at some milk quality problems. And um, the approach we're going to we're going to look at it from is first I'm going to talk about uh, just an outline um, kind of a milking center evaluation program. This is independent of size of farm or you know um, parlor or tie stall or. Um, pipeline, whatever it is, uh, we do it on all different types of farms, so it's uh, it could be used on any of those. And next, we're going to, out of those programs, talk about some of the common milking system opportunity areas that we see to reduce the risk of mastitis. And finally, uh, we're going to just touch on a couple of other um, opportunity areas that, again, we kind of, uh, we see commonly and that are outside or different than the actual milking equipment. And so we'll finish up with that. Um, but first, I uh, wanted to just outline, uh, and this is some of this is more of a thought process uh, from our end in terms of looking at uh, what we think as uh, strategies to help individual farms and their consultants or people that work with them um, actually improve um, the milk quality on their farms. And one of the ways that, that we've um, looked at is to have each farm identify the, the key players in your milk quality team, bring that uh, team together, okay? Each person within that team is probably going to have a different area of expertise, you know, your veterinarian, your milk and equipment dealer, your milking inspector, your nutritionist, other consultants, um, and depends on the farm, various other people um, that, that may be helping you out. Uh, try to encourage communication and get all those parties to share the different types of data that they're collecting so that everybody understands and has a baseline data set. And then the other thing that we found uh, to be very effective is to bring all the parties together and hold farm meetings, okay, so that all of you can sit down, interpret the data together, really truly come up with opportunity areas for the farm that everybody at the table can agree on and everybody can get behind and then help the farm to achieve those. And in order to do that, um, the, the actual set of data is, is critical. And that's one of the things that we're going to talk about today is, is just outline in brief uh, what sort of data set we would collect and provide the milk quality team with that robust set of data that you can really look at each different component and try to identify how you can improve milk quality on your individual dairy. Um, the other thing that we've realized is that, and I've realized and others that, that have helped develop this, um, is that in some cases we've done a poor job of actually helping the farm to identify at what level these opportunity areas really are. And so here we've lab labeled out three different um, ideas here. One would be a whole system level. For instance, um, we have the system vacuum set wrong. Say, okay, so that's the milking system level there. It doesn't have to be the system, milking system. It could be the system in terms of um, 
that were using uh, a very poor bedding or something like that. The next one, though, would be the individual personnel management. Okay, as we all know, it's always an issue on dairies uh, with people um, that there can be personnel management issues. And then last, though, would be to identify whether it's it really is a system or is it the people within the system or is it really a combination of the both? And after we identify the opportunity areas, right, and what we're going to do to fix them, we make a change and then come back out, which is what we haven't done on a lot of dairies, and actually take another look and see if what we changed um, really did make the change and what other areas were affected by that change. Okay, and this this repeat data collection is something, again, that uh, I'll take um, and say that I've done it poorly over time and I'm doing a better job at it now and realizing that for farms, this is one of the things that they've really come back to us and said, this is really what we needed, right? We needed you to come back out, quote, hold us accountable, help us to revisit it uh, every so often so we know you're coming on a regular basis and that's when we're going to focus on mastitis and milk quality and relook at what we did and say, did it work or not or do we need to do something different? And, and that really is, um, you know, one of the things that we think has, has helped farms to help over time develop that trend line of data to help predict stuff before it actually happens. Um, and then as well, um, reduce that tendency um, to look for something that this has to be the silver bullet, right? And in mastitis, there's a lot of different things that can be wrong. And it's very rare that it's one single thing that would be, an, be the issue. And so we tend to take this as a whole system approach and, and try to look at it in that way. So what do we measure? Um, here's, here's a long list, and it's not meant that we're going to go through all of this by any stretch today whatsoever, but one of the reasons to show this long list is to help you think through that mastitis is influenced by a lot of different variables. And when we go out and are going to assess a dairy, right, we're going to look at all of these because for instance, right, if we change the milking routine timing, it can certainly have an effect on other components. And so we have to think about this in total, and we try to do that. And as we talk about the different things today, you'll, you'll hear me reference different areas of this. Again, trying to think about this as a whole system. And when we change individual components, we got to make sure we're looking or thinking about how it influences um, the other aspects. Um, but um, you know, broken out here simply by equipment, people, and cows, and of course there's overlap between each of these, um, and then down in the bottom we can't forget, of course, the environment, the stalls, and the other environment the cows are, are in. The other thing to mention here, or just make a comment on is, you know, today um, we're not going to talk a lot about dry cows, but dry cows are a critical component in terms of mastitis, and so I don't want to not mention that, but it really isn't the focus of today. But we do see a lot of mastitis during the dry period and certainly something that we can't ignore when we look at a farm and we don't ignore it. And that's part of that environmental assessment would be to look at the dry cows. All right. So, but specifically now talking about the milking system in terms of the milking equipment, uh, four common areas that, that we're going to touch on here and that we see commonly is that we'll see inappropriate claw vacuum and pulsation settings, inappropriate automatic takeoff settings, the equipment not functioning properly, and lastly, we're going to touch on is poor unit alignment. So we'll go each, through each of these in, in some detail. So inappropriate claw vacuum settings, uh, absolutely critical and kind of in some ways um, unbelievable that on some dairies, um, we still haven't had an accurate assessment of claw vacuum um, done. At flow. So in other words, when the unit's on the cow, we do it at peak flow of that individual cow and we do a short segment, so that five to 20 second interval, and we got to do it on at least 10 cows. And this is the National Mastitis Council, the NMC, you know, sets this as part of their standard uh, and we're doing it and encouraging it um, to do it per NMC standards, which is this is taken right out of the NMC. Um, and so has it been done? We need to do, somebody needs to be there during milking um, in order to do this. And on some dairies that just hasn't happened. 
we first need to do it. And then the next one is, once we've done it, is, is it appropriate for this herd? And that's going to have to start taking into a, you know, a bunch of different categories here. In other words, the goals of the dairy. So one of the goals of this, of course, is claw vacuum influence is milking speed. So how fast do they want to milk cows? What type of liners are they using? Okay, inflations or liners, you know, are they rubber, silicone? What shape, what, what, um, what sort of characteristics? Those all influence what vacuum level we want to set the dairy at. And then the last thing I'm going to put on there is the risk of overmilking. So in other words, that means um, how much risk is there that we leave the units on too long? And that's influenced, of course, by the milking routine, strongly influenced by that. The ATL would be our automatic takeoff settings or, or lack thereof if we're just using manual. Um, and then unit alignment has a strong influence on how much over milking there might be there. So all of those we're going to take into account. And, you know, it's, it's still amazing. Um, we had a new installation here in New York. It's about 150 cow um, dairy. It was a double 10 parlor. And that parlor had been running about six months when we got called in. And unfortunately, um, the average claw vacuum, when the system was installed, was set in appropriately, and they'd been running about six months. And so there, you know, in terms of TDAN and TDAN health, um, they were already behind the eight ball because we hadn't measured the average claw vacuum accurately at the time of the installation for that individual dairy. All right. Um, and then just to give you another one, this was a, a dairy, and this is... Um, what we call short-term teach scoring, okay? So we're gonna go in and when the unit comes off the cow, we'll measure um, and take a look at what the individual cow teats look like. And on this dairy, uh, we did that. That's about a thousand cow dairy. And the initial teat scoring there in red was when I first walked into the dairy. And you can see there that hardness at the teat end means when that unit comes off, we feel firmness or edema. And most times those cows are kicking at us when we're touching the teat because their teats hurt. All right. So 70% of cows uh, on our first scoring there um, had that hardness or edema at the teat end. So quite high. You know, our goal is to be less than 20%. Um, at the same point, our technician was measuring claw vacuum. And I turned to him and asked him what it was. And he said the average claw vacuum was around 12.7 inches, which... For this dairy, with the risk of overmilking, was high. I talked to the owner because he had breezed in there within the next half hour or so that we were standing in there, and I said, "Are you, you know, do you have a reason to have it this high?" And he said, "No, you know." He said he really didn't, and they hadn't changed anything in the last um, six or eight months, uh, per his recollection. And I said, "Well, I think we need to lower it." So he said, "Fine, whatever you think we should go to." We lowered it that day. Um, and then we started teat scoring after the vacuum change. And you can see here, right, on this 1,000 cow dairy, within the matter of a couple hours, um, you know, we had dramatically changed the way those cows were being milked solely by making a vacuum setting change. And so that, that's the sort of opportunities, you know, we're thinking about or looking at. And um, on this dairy, of course, it was they just really hadn't looked at it and hadn't been done and thought about all right, so now we're going to go to a, a poll question here. Yep, we're all set. Uh, poll question here, uh, pretty straightforward. What is the best pulsator ratio for a dairy farm? 65, 35, 50, 50, 40, uh, 60, 40, 70, 30. This is obviously the, the rest versus milking pulsation. Uh, Stephen, I'll let you take your first vote. Oh, what I'll let you let think? Me. Well, let me say 60 40. I'm trying to remember my basic dairy science, but uh, let's uh, see what, what happens there. Well, I'm not sure. I, that's where I'm going to vote too, but I, I don't know if that's good or bad. I, um, uh, I, I'm, I'm nervous that maybe it makes a difference on uh, who's, whose brand it is. I, I don't know. But uh, anyway, we've got, uh, we got some slow voting here going on. Uh, come on, guys and gals. Let's get, well, on, let's get on board here. We're going to want to get over 60%. Maybe yeah, they're, they're thumbing through their Dairy Science 101s and trying to <laughs> find a little hint there. Now they're probably Googling is what they're doing. We can see. We, <laughs> oh, we, that's right. And we can, what you would do these. And we can see that as well. Let's, Jim, let's go ahead and close it off here. We got two-thirds of the vote in. And, uh, Paul, what do, you, what, do you, what do you think of the answers, uh, your thoughts? 
All right, so um, we're looking at this, and uh, 66% is the way I'm seeing our vote in 60-40. Uh, we have 22%, 65-35. Nobody on a 70-30, and a small amount there on a 50-50. And one, one of the things here with this poll question, and one of the things to bring up with it, and the reason for me asking it, was you know that each individual dairy, right, the answer is going to be different, okay? So... If, if the people that that voted 60-40, okay, and uh, for that dairy, that may exactly be correct. And, and one of the things um, is that someone needs to measure it on your dairy, okay, and measure it accurately in order for you to know what's the best ratio for your dairy. And why does it differ? Well, there was a little bit of a, uh, you know, um, Dr. Hutchin was alluding to, to product and company and, and difference in pulsators, difference in shell volume, difference in liners, difference in length of hose, all of those influence it. So for each individual dairy, right, there really isn't, we can't stand here and say what it's best for your dairy until someone is out there and actually measured it with what equipment you have, the length of hose you have, what shells type you have, what liner you have, all of those. So the, the big answer here is somebody needs to measure it for your dairy and measure it under load, and that's the, the graphic here is to show you, this is the exact same measurement, right? Um, I'm gonna point to this one. This one was done, okay, with no vacuum um, to the liner. We had teat plugs in, and the pulsators were running, but we didn't have vacuum to the liner. And then over here on the right was the same exact pulsator done when we had vacuum. And so you can see the big difference here. I'm going to point out for a second, just D phase. Here's 21% uh, in this one versus 16%, right? So if we just looked at this, we would incorrectly interpret it versus this is the real answer over here on the right-hand side. We're down to 16%, which is getting pretty low on a D phase. So in reality, we had to change this pulsation but if we inappropriately measured it, we would have had the wrong answer and we would have said, no, this is okay. Um, there's quite a bit of debate what we want to be. We tend to look at the D phase. D phase is the rest phase. And uh, general thoughts are we want to be somewhere in the 200 to 250 milliseconds of D phase. Um, and you can see here, right, depending on how we measured it, we would have made a different, uh, a different answer. So really, again, kind of like claw vacuum, the first thing, and we see it repeatedly, unfortunately, is that for, for an individual dairy, someone hasn't measured it appropriately. Therefore, we can't even start to make a determination um, whether it's appropriate for the herd until we've measured it accurately. And then once we have, then we can say, are the pulsation settings appropriate for this herd? Again, there's going to be a variation depending on the goals of the dairy and what sort of equipment and what they have. Um, and where they want to be. So there's not an exact answer. And these days we also see we can adjust them in between those ratios depending on the um, how the pulsation is being driven on the dairy. So um, the, end, the end discussion of that is we need to measure it for your dairy and then in groups, in that team group, right, we need to interpret it and say how much risk are we willing to um, accept for reward. And some of that is about how much how short can we go on massage or how fast can we milk cows? All right. Then the next area we want to talk about is the actual automatic takeoff settings. And there's a lot of discussion on this and not a lot of actually published uh, data on this. Uh, we're working on, on repeating some studies or doing some other individual studies on this to try to actually add some data. But the big thing uh, that I wanted to hit on today is are dairies actually evaluating them? Okay, and who in the management stream is responsible for this? Sometimes um, we have differences in on individual farms between an owner and a manager and or milkers, right? So sometimes um, we don't know who may or may not be actually responsible for, for making the changes and we definitely need to know that and we wanna know again as part of that team, are we making the right changes and how many changes and how often have we done them? The second component of that that we see is how do we make sure that we've actually made these changes? Because um, a lot of dairies, right, it's we can make them on a computer change, then it has to 
interface with the stall points and get out there to the actual unit. So we need to make sure, right, that that message, even though we changed it on the computer, we need to make sure it's actually out there and actually happening on the individual stall point. Um, this little graphic here um, was an example of a dairy. This is about an 1,100 cow dairy. And we had scored the teat scores here in February, right, and saw that we were a little bit higher than we wanted to be or had been, right? So we made some adjustments and we thought we had everything correct and we rechecked the takeoff settings. And then when we got there in October, we re-looked at stuff and we still had really not made any uh, changes, right? So this was still pretty uh, similar to this. In other words, too high on our short-term changes. Come to find out in here, unbeknownst to the dairyman until we looked at it at this date, um, the takeoff settings had, for whatever reason, reverted back to factory default settings, all right? So all of a sudden, when we looked at them here, they were drastically different than they had been here. In other words, we were leaving units on a lot longer than anybody wanted to on the dairy solely because um, the settings had reverted back. So it's, it's another thing. we got to keep an eye on that. We've seen that on, on multiple dairies. And we've got to be watching and making sure that somebody is actually looking at this so we know when our units are coming off cows. Um, here's a graphic just to show you, you know, I mean, for, for us, right, we're going to keep evaluating these over time. And here we have milk per cow as a, as a blue line. The main thing to take away from this is, right, over the course of this, it's about a two-year time frame. Milk for cows went up or down, but really hasn't changed dramatically, right? It's about 28, 29 pounds per cow on a 3X milk dairy. Notice we've made takeoff setting changes here. Here was one, okay, back in 2013. Here's another one in 2015. So the, what has changed, right, is our unit on time. We see a decline here, and then a pretty similar, and then we see another decline here, right? So really, we haven't changed milk. Milk per cow, it's went up or down for other reasons, but not really related to this. But now we've made takeoff setting changes and we're getting units off the cows quicker. And that means less risk of teat damage, which is a good thing. All right. This one, we're not going to spend a ton of time on this either, but this is a situation where, again, we need to confirm that what we've made in the computer has went out to the stall point. And, and this was a situation on a dairy where that wasn't the case until we realized it, and then we got it out there, and this is the seconds of time in low flow, and you notice a dramatic change here and getting down to closer to the goal that we wanted after we finally got it adjusted and got it out there to the stall point rather than just on the computer. All right. The other part of takeoff settings that we have is a component of that called the vacuum decay time. And what that means is after we shut off the vacuum to the unit, we wait X amount of time until we actually start our retraction cycle and pull the unit back. And you can see here on this picture, right, what's happened here is the unit has fell off the cow. It's hit down here. See these mouthpiece right here in this area where the cows are stepping. We have manure. We have contamination, right? And then about a second later, it retracted. So we were waiting too long to retract these units. Almost every one was falling down here and getting contaminated on the end of the, uh, the liner, and that increased our risk for mastitis. Um, so what we do, it took a little bit of time, but we uh, decreased the vacuum decay time so that the units were retracting and very few of them were hitting the deck on this dairy um, and made a big difference in terms of reducing the risk of contamination and the risk of mastitis um, solely by a, a setting change. All right, so that, that was all takeoff setting change and now we're gonna move into actual equipment not functioning properly. Um, and this is, you know, again, this is us just coming to these dairies. Um, uh, and on this dairy, they were seeing this chart here is about the new infection risk, okay? And they were seeing this increase in the new infection risk of mastitis up to 11% here in October. And they called us out and said, come on out to our dairy and see what you find. This was a, about a 600 cow dairy, the milking in a double 12 flat barn parlor. And just by walking in there and testing all the pulsators, we found that 20% of their pulsators were not functioning on one side. Um, 
Not sure how long that had been going on, right, or how much time, but certainly a large risk factor when we don't have pulsation on a teat, right, we're not properly massaging that teat, we're increasing dramatically the risk of teat damage. Um, and here, just based on the number of cows, right, I just put a figure that said 120 cows at risk at every milking on this dairy solely because our pulsators weren't functioning. Um, the dealership came out rapidly after this, corrected it. Um, it really was more on the farm end uh, in terms of not getting the dealership out there. Um, and the dealership, once they were called in, they did a nice job of correcting this. Um, the other component of equipment not functioning, um, this is an example where we had a dairy, uh, it's a double 18 parlor. Um, this dairy at the time was milking about 900 cows. And when we went in there to, to do the assessment of that parlor, a third of the claw vents were plugged, okay? They weren't using vented liners, so it's their only source of air. And what happens when you have a plugged claw vent, right? This is your claw vacuum. And I'm gonna first do a normal, so this is an open claw vent, and normally under peak flow, your claw vacuum declines, right? And then under low flow, it goes back up, and then the takeoff kicks in and it comes off. Notice on this, when we have a plug claw vent, rather than going down, the claw vacuum goes up. So for these cows, right, we were milking cows at 14 and a half inches of claw vacuum under peak flow versus what we wanted to do at 12.3, ouch. Cows were telling us not happy. Kicking unhappy cows, unhappy teats means an increased risk of mastitis. So on this dairy, we instituted and every single claw vent was opened at the start of every milking um, in order to make sure that we didn't have claw vents that were being plugged. All right, and that brings us to, to this. I mean, for me and just from the dairies we get on and and there is that schedule maintenance, you know, is a necessity on these dairies. I mean, especially the ones where we're running 24 seven, right? Remember these pumps, even during wash, the pumps aren't shutting down. So they're really running 24 hours a day on a lot of these dairies. So we definitely need to have a good system in place. We need to have it documented. A lot of the dealerships have a good way to do this, right? And charts and forms, and they can do a good job of this. Um, we can do it internally on a dairy, right? Some dairies are able to achieve this, um, meaning they have their own personnel that does a lot of the schedule maintenance. That's fine um, as well, as long as they're doing it and doing it correctly. But sometimes with the external, what we have is another set of eyes that comes in, looks at it differently, sees what they're seeing. We just need to make sure we have a good way for the dealership and the farm to communicate because some of these dairies that, that we see is for whatever reason, um, the dealership noticed an issue, but it didn't get communicated to the owners. And so we need a good avenue of communication. And that's one of the functions in my mind of the team meetings that can help to make that avenue um, of communication better. So, and this was an example here, right? This, we were running a milk line vacuum and we tend to on all our dairies when we go on, we're gonna run milk line vacuum when we get there, and we're gonna run it for at least 20, 30 minutes during normal operation. And this we were doing, right? And we opened um, two units on this parlor. It was a double 25 parlor. And if you notice here, right, with two units open on a double 25, we all of a sudden drop vacuum way down here, right down to 9.3 inches. This is milk line vacuum. Should not happen. Uh, excuse me, this was double 20 parlor, excuse me. Um, should not happen. And the issue here was um, they were running on a backup pump and they had forgot to close up some weep holes. So the backup pump really could not keep up when we had units open in the parlor. And so that again, uh, corrected it. And after that, um, the milk line vacuum held stable. Um, the more uh, the more of these we do and the more we see on these, we start to really believe in Dr. Rick Waters, uh, who's done a lot of this with myself um, and really believe in this sort of that for our dairies, we, we really would like this pre-milking checklist. And, and somebody would be um, on the dairy would actually record in some sort of book or some chart or something, the system vacuum. 
And again, this is just meant to say, you know, that we've come into these situations a week later and nobody's realized that the vacuum's off by an inch or two. And that's a big deal, right? And if we were looking at it at the start of every milking, uh, it might be uh, helpful and somebody would notice that. A lot of these, right, on these, you can put on black magic marker so you don't have to even look and know which what the setting is. It's, if it's along that black magic marker, it's right. If it's below it or above it, it's wrong. And somebody notes that and, and there. Uh, the other thing is about pulsators, right, um, would be checking that the pulsators are actually functioning. Again, it, it'd be unusual that you'd walk into a dairy and find, you know, that the pulsators really aren't working. Milkers should be able to know this, and, and I think we need to do a better job of training them so that they're actually looking at this. Claw vents, right, that's what we talked about before. We need to make sure they're open. Listen for any air leaks, and then check. Uh, any torn hoses or gaskets and certainly make sure that milkers have access so that they can grab any replacement parts right there They don't have to think about it. They just grab them put it on so that that we can keep milking and milking well And making sure we reduce the risk of teat damage The other thing that we see and certainly I think is a big opportunity area is making sure that we have a communication protocol for when equipment issues happen too often on dairies will go on and the milkers will say to us, well, two of these takeoffs aren't really working. And we'll say, well, have you, you know, have you let somebody know? And they're like, well, we did. We said something to somebody, but we haven't changed it, right? And in my mind, um, helping a dairy make sure we get a, a sort of uh, some sort of written place where we can put this, I think it should be a permanent log, like a paper, uh, you know, a notebook. We can write it down. Milker says unit number 46 isn't working right and then management can see it can take action on it call the dealership and the dealership when they come out can sign off on that same paper and say we've corrected this it should be running now uh, let us know if it isn't because too often some of these just lag on for too long and we've got cows at risk you know because we're not getting that unit off in the right time frame it should and certainly causing t end damage. So I do think this is a big area that we can work on on dairies, trying to help them do a better job of making sure, right, that we communicate when we have equipment issues and that somebody on the dairy knows and, and is responsible for getting the dealership there and making sure that the dealership has actually corrected the issue and in a time frame. Priority and time frame to resolution, right? Again, if it's a pulsator, right, every single cow that's milked with that could be at risk. So that's a high priority issue. If it's, you know, um, an individual component, you know, like a, a weld component on a unit alignment device, maybe slightly lower um, priority um, than an individual pulsator. And, uh, you know, on some of our Certainly on some of the dairies with a lot of uh, parlor software, we can certainly get and get reports of error reports right out of there on a daily basis or on each milking actually, and can tell us, right, if one of the stalls has an issue with flow rate or an issue with uh, fall off or something or um, milk harvested and start to alert us and say, yeah, we need to look at this individual stall. Some dairies, you know, they go as far with, this with a sort of checklist where they're signing off and the dairy signing off saying, yeah, we've checked each of these components and management does that. I think on a larger dairy, that's, that's a nice piece to make sure that we don't miss um, looking at individual components of the milking system and making sure that someone actually is responsible for taking care of it on a daily basis. All right, uh, we're gonna switch away now and just, uh, talk about unit alignment it's certainly something that we see as a huge opportunity area on a lot of dairies and uh, interestingly enough there really wasn't a good scoring system out there so we developed one very sophisticated from the university which is called two two category either good or bad okay we can put the proper or improper really it's about whether the units aligned well even uh, weight on all four quarters and aligned in two planes, both front to back and side to side. Um, we're gonna score cows within the first two minutes of milking, and we're gonna discount or not score any three-quarter cows or any cows with obvious poor utter confirmation. So um, we're trying to give the you know a good, well, nice uttered cow 
not three quarter cows, and we're going to do it within the first two minutes. So now uh, we're going to hit a poll question here uh, and to, to um, ask some questions on unalignment and what it influences. Well, this looks like more exciting here. Now, remember, more than one choice. You can check more than one here if you wish. Poor unit alignment influences which of the following? And here are the ones you could check. Uh, risk of line or slip. Another one is unit on time. Risk of teat and damage. Parlor efficiency. None of the above. Uh, Stephen, where are you at on this well, one here? Man, I almost would go for checking the first four or all of the above, just uh, uh, if it was up to me, because I could envision each of those things being affected by alignment. But let's see what uh, what the voters say, and we'll, we'll see what Dr. Verkler says, yeah, too. We so are really... Things again a little slow here, a little yeah. slow. Yeah, we're at 50% 50, 50 again. I, I don't know if we've got a bunch of Democrats, Republicans that are well, slow know. going I, here. It might be the independents out there that are. <laughs> I don't know what it is, but we're, we're approaching two-thirds anyway or getting up there. So. Yeah, I think we better close it off. We'll be in trouble here on time-wise. So here's okay. what we got. Uh, Dr. Volker, what do you think? All right. So we have... Uh, poor unit alignment, 88% um, said risk of teat damage, 75 risk of liner slips, 63% uh, parlor efficiency, and then a little fewer or less voting on unit on time. And we're going to cover this um, as we go next, uh, and I'm uh, going to be with Steve there and saying, yeah, we're, we're talking about all four of these, uh, all of the above um, on these, because each of these are certainly influenced um, by unit alignment. And um, so, uh, and we're gonna we're gonna touch on each of these individually and, and make sure everybody understands, uh, you know, why uh, they actually are. So everybody said teat damage there, number three, certainly uh, risk of teat damage. And one of the reasons there, of course, is that remember that on the average cow, when the automatic takeoff kicks in, there's one quarter contributing. Okay, so if we have three quarters that are done and one quarter contributing. And if we have poor unit alignment, right, which influences the milking speed of individual quarters, uh, we're gonna hold that core, that unit on a cow longer when we have poor unit alignment and therefore increase the risk of teat damage. Um, and then um, certainly longer unit on time, right, means uh, a prolonged, uh, or risk our parlor efficiency, right? Because units are held on cows longer and more chance of reattaches uh, if we milk quarters out differently. So uh, really what we're looking at here is saying, okay, so are we talking about a poorly designed unit alignment device or milkers not using the device appropriately? And that's what the answer, we're gonna try to get back to ownership, right? Because that's gonna be what they're gonna say is, what are we gonna do about it? Right? So do we change our unit alignment device or get a better one or different one? Or is it that we have a good one and the milkers are not using that? And that's what we're going to try to help them with. Notice on this picture, right, we have an improper unit alignment. We have this hose twisted. It's pulling this unit this way. And notice what it's doing here as a close-up in terms of the weight on these individual quarters, right? So it changes it, changes the weight, which changes the milking speed and the dynamics of the up and down on this individual quarter. Um, now we talked about uh, liner slips, right? And here it is happening in real, real um, there. So we had a vacuum recorder on, right? So we have this quarter, right? Which is done milking now, this quarter still milking. And so then we see this unit uh, liner slip on this there. And here's the vacuum recording, this large irregular vacuum fluctuation, right? Which is a known cause and risk, increased risk of mastitis. So we don't like that, right? We want these units aligned well. We don't want this increased risk of liner slip. Okay, here we have differential milk out or the quarters milking at different rates. So here we have this quarter, right? That still um, has quite a bit of milk in it. And these quarters, all three of these other quarters were done, right? And this was keeping that unit on. So now, this may not be, you know, a huge deal in terms of uh, the amount of milk left in this. We've milked some out of this, right? But what it does do is starts to hold up and change the unit on time. And that's why we worry about it. And then we worry about teak damage on these other three 
um, there. So we, we'd rather not have that. We want that unit aligned perfectly. Okay, here's two herds, just to give you an idea of what it looks like when we score it, right? Um, here's two herds. On this herd, um, we scored 160 cows. This herd, we scored 91. And what you see here, right, is that in this herd, we had about 32% that were well aligned versus 82% that were poorly aligned. So large difference between these, right? We're gonna get worried about this. We're gonna be less worried about this herd. This was a this was a herd that actually was a herringbone with arms, well aligned. This was a rotary parlor uh, with no unit alignment. And so the majority of cows had poor unit alignment and therefore we had an increased risk of teak damage and liner slips and prolonged unit on time on that dairy. All right. Now to finish up here in the last little bit, uh, we're just going to run through quick and not spend a ton of time, but just throw them out there. Um, some other opportunities that we see routinely um, on dairies, and this is going to do with water use, towels, and skin condition, and last but not least, uh, milking routine. So this uh, single slide on this, just to make everybody aware, right, we see this a lot and we see big differences between dairies in terms of the amount of water use. This guy, right, he's spraying this deck and notice these cows here, right, and we're aerosolizing all these pathogens right to these cows that have just exited. Now, hopefully we got post-dip on them, but that's, you know, that's kind of a risky thing, right? We're spraying manure water toward cows that are, have open teat ends because we just got done milking them. This is, a, this is something to think about in your own dairies and try to, you know, reduce this risk by not allowing this to happen or controlling this water use in a much better manner than just spraying it toward these cows. Um, towels, uh, certainly we see a lot of variation on farms in terms of towels and how they uh, wash them. And um, the biggest thing right and and so we do cow cultures other labs do them as well right so we take that cow culture here right and on this individual towel right we're up at almost 400,000 bacteria so we shouldn't be in anywhere near that level a lot of towels we see that are dried we see them at zeros so a um, difference now this is what you're wiping your cow off with that you're trying to wipe clean right and you don't want to do that you want a clean towel when you're wiping your cow so Sufficient hot water is an issue. You know, maybe we're running this when we're running other stuff, so we just don't have enough hot water um, there. We see that on dairies. Uh, amazingly, seen dairies that that run it as cold water. Okay, and so, boy, we think we need hot water in the washing of towels. The other big issue is load size, right? So milkers um, just try to push uh, and put as many towels in there as they can, and we just don't get a good uh, clean of the towels because the washer's jammed full. Uh, the last thing is, if we're not going to dry towels in our mind, uh, in our world, uh, then we want you to use chlorine in the rinse cycle. If you use it, just push chlorine right in during the detergent, all that manure just uses up the chlorine. So you really need chlorine during the rinse cycle if you're not going to dry your towels. All right. And then, um, Teat skin condition challenges, um, this has been something that's really come onto the radar and the more herds that, that we teat score, the more we see this. There's just large variations in herd, between herds in terms of teat skin condition. Some of it's influenced certainly by weather, um, but there's other influencers out there that we're seeing that are, that are individual dairies and just risk of, of poor skin condition. This is an 800 cow dairy here that we score pretty routinely. And you can see here from 2014, excuse me, uh, 2014 up to 2017. And we just, it was a poor skin condition herd and they really made a drastic change in terms of um, their emollient package and their dips. And we just uh, almost overnight, right, saw just a, a change from here down to here um, in the skin condition of that dairy, you know, based on going to a, a better packaged emollient. So, and then this dairy is uh, about a 1,200 cow dairy, and here, you know, they were at a good skin condition, and now we've saw uh, a large change in terms of much drier skin here, and now we're starting to see these open lesions, which I'm going to show you a picture of next, but a, a drastic change in this dairy, and it looks to be related to, to some of the bedding and, and lime use and other stuff on this dairy, um, and in terms of skin condition, you know, 
what we're seeing is this dry skin. It starts like this. These teats, you can see how dry this skin is. And we get these little cracks here, right? And over time, these cracks, they don't heal well because we're milking this cow, this teat, and we're causing trauma on it. And of course, cows laying in bedding, it's not really that clean. And so we don't see it. So these lesions don't heal that well, and they start to become a little more chronic. And then we can see real chronic lesions right over time. But all of this in, in our mind, in a lot of cases, on a lot of our dairy starts right here with dry skin. It starts to crack, and then we end up with some real severe issues, right, um, that hopefully can prevent it by really getting better skin condition from the start. All right, one last poll here. We're going to open her up and, and uh, hit uh, some milk and routine stuff. Yes, uh, let's get voting here. The goal for lag time from stimulation to unit attachment for milking, dairy, uh, dairy milking 3X. That could be important, Steve, I think. Should Hold be. 3X. Um, uh, six, mm. six to 90 seconds, greater 90 seconds, less than 60 seconds, at least 180 seconds. I know which one to eliminate, but Paul, but at this time, uh, Steve, uh, what's your thoughts? Well, I think I'm going to go with 60 to 90, but for 3X, maybe it's less than 60. I'm not sure. We're going to have to see what uh, Paul says about this. Yeah. How's the voting line? Yeah, it's, uh, uh we're it's picking up. slow again. Yeah, we're, yeah, we're picking coming, up. We're coming. It's like coming. We've got a clear winner out there, but is maybe... It, is it a winner? <laughs> let's, yeah, is it a winner? That's right. <laughs> Jim, let's go ahead and close it and see what uh, okay. Dr. Volker has, uh, Vickler has to say. All right. And so, yeah, we do, have, uh, we do have a clear winner there at 60 to 90 seconds. And what I'd say to you is, uh, yeah, so that's what we kind of thought for quite a while as the industry. We thought we, we kind of wanted to be in that 60 to 90 Boy, the more work and some of the work out of here with Dr. Waters, PhD, and other, we're talking about greater than 90. So we're really at the second one there, okay? So if you were thinking 60 to 90 and you were, you're leaning toward 90, you're okay there. I'm okay with that. We need to be 90, though. And we're starting to put a floor on that. And by a floor, I mean is that we're actually, on our timings, we look at the percent below 90 seconds. Because the more we look at this and the more we see on these 3X dairies, the closer we are to 90 seconds, it looks like the better letdown and the happier the cows are. So we're going to be um, we're going to be down in here this 90 seconds for a 3x dairy. Now, if you're talking 2x, right, 60 to 90 would be a good answer. Um, but 3x, we want to be 90 seconds, and we really don't want to be below it. The problem is, it's kind of like other stuff. The minute we start going below, then we go way below, right? So then we get down to the 60 and we'd rather be 90 or above we don't want to be uh, um, you know maybe more than 180 but we we want to be this 90 second um, and you know this slide just a reminder milking routine absolutely critical milking staff review retraining of milking staff it's a constant ongoing on all dairies we need to do it it's it's the absolute backbone in terms of mastitis prevention is that who's ever milking these cows does it well and does it consistently day to day. So I don't want to leave that. And the areas, you know, that, that we're going to monitor or see certainly our pre-dip contact time, making sure we get enough dip contact in terms of the pre-dip. We want to make sure we got that lag time. And again, we're going to say 90 for a 3X dairy and teat and cleanliness, a huge, huge issue across dairies. We really don't have a great way to automatically check this. We need to get in there with a white gauze after the milkers have performed their routine we see large differences between dairies, and this is about getting that teat and clean itself, right, which is a large risk factor for mastitis. So in terms of the summary, um, what we're thinking here is, you know, we want to do that detailed analysis. We want to do it on a regular schedule, um, correct any major issues, and then reassess the system to make sure that the changes that we made were appropriate. Um, and, uh, you know, in terms of a new system and setting it up right, we want to definitely make sure that, that everything starts right. And then, as we talked about, make sure that we have a scheduled maintenance system in place so we're performing it regularly. Um, the other big issue we touched on, right, was making sure that we have a plan to detect and rapidly correct any equipment issues uh, at every milking so that we don't let those go over time. We want proper unit alignment right, with well-designed equipment and trained milkers to use it, and certainly don't want to forget um, that water use that we talked about, 
making sure we launder our towels well, have good teat skin condition, and of course the absolute critical is the milking routine. So, very good. All right. Okay. Well, Paul, thank you very much uh, for uh, <laughs> a great presentation. Very practical. Uh, it's the kind of presentation that uh, uh, makes me want to go out to the, our porch dairyman farm right away <laughs> and just check out some of these things uh, that uh, uh, seem to be obvious, but uh, or maybe are so close to us that we just. Uh, don't stay on top of them as much as we can. So we really appreciate a great job there on, on troubleshooting. And uh, we also appreciate the sponsorship of uh, uh, Acumen for the, today's webinar. And uh, it's a chance for me now to say looking ahead, January 8th, our next webinar be a little bit of a different webinar for us. Uh, Tom Castell, Holstein breeder from here in Wisconsin and his nutritionist, Steve Wood Woodfoot, We'll be talking about getting 40,000 pounds of milk per cow, and that's pretty much on a herd basis. Incredible job that they do up there. Sponsorship coming from QLF on that. And then looking a little bit further ahead, uh, a science journalist, uh, and Nina Teicholz, will be talking about separating fact and fiction on the animal fats in our diets. And uh, that's uh, going to be a very interesting session. Uh, we're sure. So again, uh, for those that were uh, with us today, we had a nice big audience out there. Be sure, uh, we appreciate your input uh, on uh, the survey that you'll be getting, a very brief survey here in the next couple of days. And then also a, another reminder that this webinar in a couple of days and all of our previous webinars will be available through the webinar archives just by going to hordes.com and uh, following the prompts through that uh, through that process. Now, Mike, uh, uh, we've given Paul a chance to catch his breath. What about uh, some questions that you might uh, have out there? Yes, Steve, we've got, uh, Paul, we've got some very good questions. So here we go on the speed round, as we call it here. Uh, first one is, uh, does a qu robotic quarter milking have advantages over the cluster milking in terms of risks that you addressed in this presentation? The, the robotic milker, they, I believe, Paul, they drop off uh, quarter by quarter when that quarter is done. Yeah, yeah, great question, and uh, certainly it is. Um, you know, robotics come with some other challenges and other differences, but from the individual risk of individual overmilking on the quarter level, it's it certainly becomes a different discussion, and uh, the a unit alignment um, in terms of the influence of one quarter on the others is no longer an issue. Yep. Very good. Uh, another interesting question. Any thoughts on cubicle management and its effects on mastitis rate? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And, and again, you know, that, that was certainly something that we didn't, uh, uh, that I didn't touch on here. You notice it was part of that environmental assessment. Uh, we think it's an absolute, um, uh, you know, a large influence as well, no question. Um, when those cows go back and their teat ends are open, um, what they lay in, in terms of the bedding and the bug numbers in there, um, is, a, is a big issue. And it's certainly been something that we've been working on and others as well, um, trying to put some more clarity behind the, the numbers in terms of looking at bedding counts and bedding numbers and how we take those. And, you know, you can expect to see more stuff from us um, on, on those because it's been an area of focus for us. And, and it absolutely is critical cubicle management or freestyle management. Um, and one of the things there that, that also is about is uh, how well we bed freestalls in different stalls because the usage rates out of different sections of freestalls is different. And we need to think about that. And uh, so, yeah, no question. And related to another one of your points, a question came in about the dry skin strategies. Uh, uh, if we are suspicious, especially with winter now coming, should we be looking at a different teat dip? Should we be looking at a different emolument? Uh, uh, what, what can I do about these dry teat ends uh, when they, I, I see them on my herd? Yeah, definitely. And the first is the recognition. So first is knowing that they're there, right? And then, and in my own mind, it also be knowing that they're there in terms of what the baseline was. I mean, I'm always skeptical on a single individual score on a herd, but as we score over time, we really start to see herds fall into patterns. Um, and then I'm a lot more um, 
sure that 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 this herd, you know, that there is an issue that's an ongoing issue. And then, yeah, the way we're going to look at it and address it um, is is start to look at at the emollient package of dips. And it's not as simple as the numbers, right? There's different emollients, and that starts to become, you know, a bit a bit more of a longer discussion. But having the data, the baseline, you start making changes and then decide if it's making a change in your skin condition. Um, and so the encouragement would be that you've scored it, you've scored it accurately, and then you make a change and see if it really has made a difference. Because we, we do see differences uh, like those herds I showed you where, where we can see sustained um, differences based on dip changes. Very good. Um, here's a fun one. I'll, 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 I'll paraphrase a little bit. Do you see vacuum variation, especially at the TDAN, in herds with three-quarter cows? And what would be the strategy in terms of, of do you pinch over the liner or do you put a plug in? or well, What are your strategies when you're milking three-quarter cows in terms of vacuum variation? Yeah, it's good. Uh, we definitely want, uh, in my mind, uh, we should be using a teat plug um, on three-quarter cows. The only caveat to that is we got to make sure those teat plugs that we disinfect them, right? They got to stay clean. We can't just, you know, let them hit the ground or, or put them in some contaminated bucket or something and not, and then use them on the next cow because that can spread mastitis. We don't want that to happen. We do want to have a plug so we don't get, you know, vacuum variation coming in that that liner that's not on a cow um, and trying to not uh, let it affect unit alignment you know that's a big challenge on three-quarter cows we really struggle to get good unit alignment on three-quarter cows definitely but I, I'd prefer the plug yep very good hey here's an uh, interesting question came in early and now it's been adjusted a little bit and that is a herd has a 45,000 semantic cell count and still seeing some cases of mastitis what can he or she do about that yeah so um it's it's a good question you know i i tend to be not in the camp of that the bulk tank cell count influences um the risk of mastitis right so each quarter on the cow has a different cell count and the bulk tank is is uh it's tough to, it goes up a long way to get it to relate to the individual quarter cell count of a cow right so um to me, that's that's going to be the same risk assessment that we're going to do on a cow a herd that's got a forty-five thousand, as one that's got a two hundred thousand. Um, is we're going to look for those areas where we're seeing um, mastitis risk factors that could lead to mastitis, you know, on your dairy. So I mean, I wouldn't I wouldn't treat it any differently if that's what the question. Yep. Here's one from one of our international uh, attendees, and that is, what is the best solution to pre-dip, and do you have any guidelines on the dosage of the product in the pre-dip solution? Your thoughts about pre-dipping, and maybe you want to expand that to post-dip as well. Sure, yeah. Uh, we, we are in the camp of pre-dipping here, um, mainly because of its, um, uh, it's a huge uh, reduction in the risk of environmental mastitis. And so we are going to pre-dip here. One of the big things, though, right, is that pre-dip is not going to, uh, if the cows are coming in dirty due to poor stall maintenance, poor um, pre-stall um, grooming and such, pre-dip isn't going to help you there, right? It only does so much. So the, the, the ways their pre-dip helps when those cows are coming in as clean as they can, we get the pre-dip on, and then we completely wipe it off and do a good job cleaning the teat in, it, it really does help. In terms of dosage, uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna um, avoid that in terms of that because then we have to start talking about the different product type, disinfectant types, um, and that's gonna be pretty variable. But I would use a commercially available by a good reputable company and the pre-dip labeled pre-dip. Um, and then the post-dip, the pre-dip we don't have to have near the emollient levels. Um, because it's not on there for long enough for the emollients really to make a big difference. But post-dip, we then start worrying about the product, the the um, percentage, and then certainly the emollient package of the post-dip product. Here's a good one to probably end up today on, and that is what is the best way to enforce milking protocols on the farm? Any guidelines on that with your experiences? Yeah, so it, it's a great one to end on. And, and uh you know, my first thought is, and I know I think there was a webinar, I think uh, Dr. Reed did one in terms of, you know, looking at all the parlor numbers. And if you have that data, 
that that's an absolute critical that somebody is looking at that because we can tell very easily in terms of the milking protocols if you have parlor flow rate data you can tell whether they're following them or not based on the flow rates if you don't have that then it's somebody that's in there on a on a regular basis that's checking on milkers and making sure that, you know that that they're actually doing the routine uh, some dairies we achieve that by video you know and short reviews of video surveillance on a random basis some dairies are able to do that um, each dairy in my mind um, has to kind of develop something that's workable for them but then the biggest critical component is that they do it over time and stay on it because otherwise it's a, just a matter of time before we see procedural drift and if we don't account for that um, we get into a very poor situation. So we need that. We need to have something that the dairy is willing to do over time. It doesn't have to be a Cadillac system. They just have to stay on it and and have some some way that they're going to know what's going on in that parlor on a regular basis. And it may be you know video. It may be using the parlor software data. It may be actually going in there and watching it. Um, and all of those can work. Just depends on the dairy and how how they want to do it. Well, Dr. Verkler, you've done a yeoman's job here. I think we'll turn it back to Steve. And if you want to wrap up our webinar for December, we'll do it at this point. And, uh, okay. Paul, if you can click back, that would be good. Yes, Paul, thank you so much again for a very uh, informative, uh, well done uh, presentation. Good job with the questions and answers as well. And again, thanks to Acumen Detection for their sponsorship of today's webinar. Looking ahead again, feeding and handling, managing for 40,000 pounds of milk per cow uh, in October or January webinar and in February, just separating fact from fiction on the animal fat diet uh, issue that uh, has been around in our industry for decades now. Some, some very interesting stuff on that uh, in, in our February webinar. So that uh, with those comments, this is Steve Larson up here at Horst Dairyman in Fort Atkinson, Wisconsin signing off thanking you all uh, for being with us today and we look forward to having you with us on future webinars